old pal. You look like you've got something really important on your mind. That I have, Carl. It's an idea I think you can use for a meeting with your mechanics. In fact, I'd like to tell you how one service manager really put across the important story of combustion. His name was Mac McNeely, and here's how he greeted a customer friend one day. Why, hi there, Bill. Say, I haven't seen you in quite a while. That's right, Mac. My car's been running fine, but I came in for some information about my wife's car. Sure, Bill. What's on your mind? Well, Mac, you know that this car is the one my wife drives to school, the stores, the ladies' social, and so on. I bought it at the same time. In my sales work, I'm on the road a lot. Sometimes stay out of town overnight. However... Both my wife Mildred and I buy our gas at Joe's Corner Station because it's so convenient. Joe's open all hours and is usually a dependable guy. But lately, he's been suggesting that Millie change oil more often than I think she should. She doesn't drive anywhere near the miles I do. The car's been driven only a few hundred miles since the last change. Millie's a slow, careful driver. And now, I knew I could get the right story from you. Is Joe just trying to sell more oil? Oh, I, I don't think Joe would do a thing like that, Bill. But I tell you what, let's take a look at the dipstick, shall we? Hmm. Well, the oil does look dirty, that's for sure. Now, here. Feel how pasty that oil is? Well, you see, it's contaminated with sludge and carbon. Well, that's neither the fault of the oil nor of the engine. It's caused, Bill, by the type of driving that your wife does. I still don't get it, Mac. My wife's a good driver. Oh, sure, Bill. Millie's a good driver, I know that. But you see, she doesn't drive far enough for the lubricating oil to warm up or fast enough so that the crankcase vapors can be drawn off by the crankcase ventilating system. Well, that's what's caused this condition that we call cold engine sludging. In other words, your wife's stop-and-go driving habits put a very unusual and severe demand on the engine. That type of driving doesn't permit the vapors to be carried away, so sludge begins to form. That's why the oil and the filter in Millie's car should be changed more often than in yours. Well, I agree that this oil should be changed. I don't know when that filter was changed, so you'd better take care of that, too. Now, I'd like to know more about why the oil in Millie's car didn't hold up as good as that in my car. Count me in on that, Mac. I'd like to learn more about oil contamination, too. Sure, Larry. This isn't a closed meeting. Actually, there are a lot of mechanics as well as owners who should get better acquainted with the effects of sludge on an automobile engine. I guess that means we should start with the story of combustion. Swell, Mac. That'll give me a chance to smoke my morning pipeful. Well, speaking of pipe smoking, you know many things that happen in tobacco combustion also happen when air and fuel burn in an engine. Except that I guess you don't get any power out of that pipe, do you, Larry? For example, the engine is basically an air pump. It draws large swallows of air, along with small sips of gasoline, into the cylinders by way of the intake valves. Once the mixture is in the cylinders, the intake valve closes, and the piston moves up to compress that air-fuel mixture. I see. Like packing the tobacco in my pipe. That's about it. But engine compression brings the gasoline and air particles closer together so that they'll burn faster and create maximum pressure. Now, these high pressures produce more power as the burning gases expand during the power stroke. The exhaust valve opens towards the end of the power stroke. Then, as the piston comes up on the exhaust stroke, it forces the hot burned gases out past the exhaust valve and out through the muffler and tailpipe. But let's take a look at the composition of air and fuel before combustion. Why, uh, air is mostly oxygen, right? No, not quite, Larry. Air is actually about 79 parts nitrogen and about 21 parts oxygen by weight. And during the air-fuel mixing, it's the oxygen that teams up with gasoline to form a vapor that'll burn. The nitrogen doesn't burn. It just goes along for the ride and passes out with the exhaust. That's interesting. By the way, what's gasoline made of? Well, Bill, gasoline is made up of hydrocarbons. That's a fancy name for hydrogen and carbon. They put in other compounds sometimes, such as tetraethyl lead for anti-knock value and additives to retard gum formation. Now, because air is only about 21% oxygen, and oxygen is the only part we use, a lot of air has to be pumped in before we have enough oxygen to mix with the gasoline to make a good mixture that'll burn properly. In fact, one gallon of gasoline needs about 1,230 cubic feet of air for ideal combustion. 
That's as much air as there is in an average bedroom. And it's the carburetor's job to meter the right amount of gasoline to get a good air-fuel mixture, right? That's right, Larry. You see, Bill, an ideal power mixture would be 12 to 13 parts air and one part fuel. Well, that's really too rich for average driving, so the carburetor provides this mixture only at wide open throttle for acceleration or top speed. The most economical mixture is 16 to 17 parts air to one part gasoline. So the carburetor has to vary the mixture according to engine demand. It supplies this cruising range mixture for the majority of driving. Now so far we've talked about ideal combustion, where the air and fuel mixture is burned and exhausted completely with no after effects. Of course, that's just the theoretical side of the story. For example, that pipe full that Larry's working on right now is never totally consumed, you know. There's ash, soot, and other carbon particles. On the stem are sticky coal tar compounds and water. Well, now, similar chemical changes take place in engines. The mixture, oxygen from the air plus hydrogen and carbon from the gasoline, burns and produces water in the form of steam. In fact, would you believe it, for one gallon of gasoline burned, more than one gallon of water is produced. Besides that, there are many other products in the burned gases, too. These include things like, oh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, carbon, acids, and resins, which are unburned particles of fuel. Then there is also lead oxide from the burning of the tetraethyl lead. Now, most of these products pass out when the exhaust valve opens and are expelled through the exhaust system. I see, Mac. That's very interesting. But on the other hand, some of these products don't go out with the exhaust. Instead, they get down into the crankcase and they contaminate the lubricating oil. Well, the amount of contamination depends upon, first, the condition of the engine, second, the type of driving, and third, the quality of the gasoline and oil. Now, it's engine condition and type of driving that we're concerned with in your case. They explain why the oil in your wife's Plymouth requires more frequent changes than the oil in your own car. You see, during the power stroke, some exhaust mixture blows by the piston rings and into the crankcase. When the engine is warm, like when you've driven your car for some distance, the blow-by consists of gases and extremely fine particles of carbon. The gases leave by way of the ventilation system. The carbon particles enter the oil. These particles later are removed by the oil filter. When the oil filter is clean, oil contamination takes place very slowly. But during cold operation, Many blow-by products that would normally be gases are liquid, such as water and fuel. Now, these go into the oil, contaminating it. Besides that, there's increased contamination during cold operation because of the choke action providing a one-to-one air-fuel mixture ratio for starting. Also, water and fuel condense on the coal cylinder walls and run down past the rings. The water holds the solid particles together and forms sludge. The gasoline dilutes the oil and destroys its lubricating properties. Well, that certainly sounds like an interesting story, Tech. I really wish that I'd been there. Swell, Carl. But if you want to hear more, let's turn the record over. Now, Carl, Mac wanted to explain that blow-by carried other products of combustion down into the oil. So here's what he said next. As you know, Bill, the rings don't form as good a seal when they're cold, so blow-by is greater. Water and acid products of combustion are forced down into the crankcase. It's the acid product of combustion, what they call sulfurous acid, that sometimes corrodes and etches bearings, piston pins, and cylinder walls. And when acid vapor, which passes out with the exhaust, condenses in the muffler, it eventually eats holes from the inside out. By the way, Cooling system seepage because of an improperly tightened cylinder head can also contaminate and dilute the oil. What happens when these products get in the oil, besides diluting it? Well, Larry, the combustion products in oil congeal or collect in soft, pasty form. Some remain in suspension for a while and are circulated to the working parts. Some deposit along the way and gradually harden. Now, if there are any unburned particles of fuel called resins in the deposits, They'll become sticky, like varnish. When they solidify, they can form a coating on parts just like varnish put on with a brush. Hey, that sludge can really raise a ruckus, huh? 
Yeah, it sure could. If it weren't for some features of our engines which keep the formation of sludge under control, we'll uh, talk about those in a minute, but let's go on with our story. Any dried particles circulated and deposited throughout the engine can clog oil passages and screens, blocking lubrication to vital parts. They can even clog oil passages in piston oil rings and pistons and cause the rings to stick. This leads to excessive oil consumption. Is that also what causes sticking valves? That's it, Larry. Especially intake valves, because they're cooler. Resins in vapor form, drawn through the valve guides, deposit quicker on cool surfaces. As they condense and solidify, they can eventually cause sticking. Incidentally, sludge can occur in any season. However, most people take weekend trips during the summer, which warms the oil enough to clear out the contamination. But during the cold months, sludge accumulates faster because the car isn't driven far enough to warm up the oil. Even though the temperature gauge shows the engine is warm? Yes, indeed, Bill. You see, that gauge tells the water temperature in the hottest part of the cooling system. It's no indication of crankcase oil temperature. In fact, engine head temperature may read 140 degrees, while engine oil is only 40 degrees. Wow, that's a wide range, all right. Sure is, Larry. And it takes up to 10 miles of continuous driving to raise oil temperature high enough to vaporize combustion products that are in the oil. Solid particles, of course, settle in the oil. But like I said before, the engine is well protected. For example, the filter removes solid particles from oil circulated through it. And that's why it's mighty important to change that filter at the mileage is recommended. The crankcase ventilating system is the biggest help in removing harmful vapors. So always keep the screens at the crankcase breather pipe and ventilator outlet pipe clean. On some models, that outlet pipe screen is an extra equipment item. It should be installed in dusty areas or whenever an owner does a lot of dirt road driving to keep dust from being drawn into the engine. How's that ventilating system work, Mac? Well, Bill, that ventilator pipe, cut at a sharp angle, extends straight down into the air stream below the engine. As the car moves forward, air rushes past, creating a partial vacuum in the pipe. Now that draws fresh air into the crankcase through the breather pipe and out through the outlet pipe, carrying the crankcase vapors along with it. Naturally, at slow speeds or on short trips, there's little or no circulation. Vapors can condense and settle in the oil. That makes sense. And now, getting back to the $64 question, how can you tell when oils should be changed? Well, Bill, remember, high detergent oils are darker than regular oils and quickly turn black in use. So black oil on the dipstick is not a good clue in itself. However, if the oil feels gritty or pasty, change it. And if it has a decidedly gray color, that means lead salts from tetraethyl lead, and it's another signal to change the oil. In addition, a milky or cloudy appearance or a chocolate-tinged oil indicates the presence of water. In either case, check for the leak and change the oil. Well, Mac, what about those mileage recommendations in the owner's handbook? Why, those recommendations in the book are the ones to follow, Bill. They're good for the great majority of our owners. But, like everything else, exceptions have to be made to take care of unusual conditions. And Millie's case is an example. That's why the handbook suggests that owners check with their dealers. That way, exceptions can be made for the small percentage of people who drive under unusual conditions. You mean slow driving, short trips, especially in cold weather, and extremely dusty roads? Exactly, Bill. That's why we tailor our recommendations to the driving habits of our owners. And in special cases, we make oil change recommendations so they'll keep the formation of sludge under control. Okay, but how about cars equipped with torque converters? Well, with torque converters, which get their oil supply from the engine, oil changes need be made only twice a year or every spring and fall. A larger volume of oil is used, which can absorb more combustion products before it needs changing. Also, oil filters are changed every 5,000 miles, which also keeps the oil cleaner. I'm wondering if changing to a hotter spark plug would cut down sludging. Hmm, well, I'm against changing spark plugs, Larry. The plugs that come with the car meet all engine requirements of average driving conditions. Now, if a plug has been used that's too hot for the driving done, you'll notice a light, chalky white deposit and no hard carbon. There'll be signs of extreme heat, porcelain blistering or cracking, and severe erosion. But if the plug is too cold, 
There'll be heavy soot and carbon deposits. They'll look oily wet and the carbon will be soft. We use the spark plug recommended for each model as shown in this reference book. Say, here's an important point. A short trip driver like your wife, Bill, should have a 180 degree thermostat installed to keep the cooling system at a higher temperature. Remember, low engine temperature is the main cause of sludge formation. Incidentally, Bill, maybe your wife lets the engine idle a while after starting for warm up. Well, actually, the engine will warm up faster if it's driven at a moderate speed as soon as the oil gauge shows pressure. Say, Mac. Does the exhaust system have an effect on combustion? Uh, it sure does, Larry. A properly operating exhaust system is mighty important. Take the manifold heat control valve, for example. The heat control valve directs hot exhaust gases around the heat chamber of the intake manifold. Now that preheats the mixture and vaporizes the fuel before it gets into the cylinder during warm-up. Naturally, the more completely the fuel is vaporized, the more power you get out of it. If that mixture gets preheated too much after warm-up, the engine loses power. If it doesn't get enough heat when the engine's cold, you'll have poor warm-up. Well, you'll find the complete story on all types of heat control valves in this reference book, Larry. Golly, I didn't know the heat valve was that important. Well, that it is. You've got to be sure it moves freely. If it's stuck, you'll have to free it up. Well, Mac, you've sure opened my eyes. From now on, I'll leave my car home occasionally and use my wife's car. I'll drive it far enough and fast enough to cut down engine sludge. Yes, sir. That's a good idea, Bill. Say, that Mac fellow did a fine job of explaining. I bet you were downright proud of him. That I was, Carl. And here's why. If every mechanic knew that combustion story as well as Mac, he'd not only understand engine conditions better, but he'd also find it easier to explain these conditions to the customer. Naturally... That means customer confidence in the mechanic, in the product, and in the dealership. And that all adds up to a successful service operation. 